Hello and welcome to this quick, well, I won't say it's quick, but we'll say it's a video for the ASC computer. Now, I'm going to be recording it directly off the screen um, as I don't have my little card for recording lovely crystal clear video. But the LCD screen here that we're recording off should be pretty good and we should get a clear picture. This is the same ASC computer 25 megahertz that we've been running in previous videos and showing you such things as the proprietary slot for the daughter board and the video card and the built-in video card that was on that motherboard as well. Um, the information that I give in these videos is as accurate as I know best. But as I said already, it's my video, you know. <laughs> That's a joke. Anyway, let's go into the BIOS, or CMOS, to give it its original proper name. Uh, and we will have a look at that. So here we go. That's a lovely line there. Yeah. To get into the actual system BIOS on the ASD computer, you have to press Control Alt and Escape on the keyboard. And um, see, there it says no keyboard or keyboard error. There we are. We're in there. Now, more modern BIOSes would use like the F2 key or the Delete key or whatever. But this fellow uses Control Alt and Escape. Now, what you have there in front of you is the first page of the system setup. So we we'll start off at the top, okay? Very self-explanatory. Date, time, diskette A, diskette B. Diskette A is 1.44 megabytes. That's the floppy drive of this computer, the standard three and a quarter inch floppy drive, or the hard floppy disks that most people would have seen. Uh, the one below it is the diskette B. Okay, again, these are drive designations, just in case you're wondering. Um, every drive of the computer must have a designation. So the hard drive is generally the C drive. Floppy drives are generally A or B drive, and CD-ROM drives or optical drives are generally a D drive. But, in theory, you can set a hard drive to any level you like between A to Z. Okay? Okay, so, as I was saying, this is the B drive, 1.2 megabytes. Depending on the type of drive that you have, um, that would dictate what setting you put in there. Now, there are different settings for those, but they are the correct settings for the two drives currently installed, so I'm not going to change them. Okay, 1.2 megabyte is for the five and a quarter inch floppy disk, or those big black beetles that are very, very flexible. Um, I will show them to you in a later video if you so request to see them. No problem, I do have them. I have loads of, of boxes of new ones. Boxes and boxes and boxes of them. So if anyone would like to see them or anyone would like to buy them, let me know. Next we have is the fixed disk uh, drive zero and fixed disk drive one. Now these two particular uh, settings here. Um, the computer came with a, a predefined set of uh, hard drive uh, choices. So if I press, I think it's F4. Oh, sorry. If I press F4 from here, sorry. It'll now give you a list of the hard drives that are available on the AST computer system BIOS. Now, this is not exclusive to AST computers. Other computer manufacturers also had system BIOSes with a choice of hard drives that were predetermined. Um, this particular hard drive is designated as a 17, or Type 17. It's actually written on the hard drive, but on more modern hard drives, or even on other hard drives that aren't manufactured by AST Computer, um, for example, hard drives that are manu manufactured by Baxter, Quantum, Conor Peripherals, uh, Seagate, Western Digital, and so on, all these hard drive manufacturers all have a, a um, designation on the hard drive, and it will tell you what the cylinders are, the heads are, the sectors are. Okay. Most modern computers, though, don't need this information. So if you have a more modern S88 hard drive, these ones, by the way, are known as ATA hard drive, although some people call them IDE. IDE was coined by Western Digital. It's not the true name. It's actually a ATA, or some people call them uh, PATA. Now, the configuration in here on modern computers is automatic. So you would just choose auto and it detects the cylinders, the heads, the sectors automatically. On the older machines, it's file it off the hard drive, contact the manufacturer, put them in yourself manually, or choose a predetermined uh, you know, type of hard drive. In this case, as I said, it's a Type 17. The hard drive is actually a 40 megabyte hard drive. And again, that's already set up, but I set that up earlier on. Um, if you want to go through that in detail, I'll show it to you on a, on a more modern machine that uh, you know has a bit more choice to it. Okay? Um, but as you see there, there's a, there's a whole bunch of, of, of choices. Um, if you want to set up your own choice on this, you can choose either a Type 98 or a Type 99 drive. 
we have two choices available because the uh, connector on this board, the uh, ATA IE cable connector, allowed for two drives to be installed in this, this particular computer. So you can install a two floppy drives, an A and a B, which is what most people would do, and then two hard drives, which again would be a C and a D. An optical drive wasn't really available at the time. They were available, but they were very expensive, and most people wouldn't have them. Most uh, most people would have would be two hard drives on the computer, and two floppy drives. They wouldn't really have had an optical drive in them. That was something that was uh, brought along later on. And finally, one other quick note is, if you do install an optical drive on these computers, most people would have purchased an external um, parallel CD-ROM drive or an internal ISA card that would have the ability to read you know, up to four drives rather than the standard two drives this computer reads. Moving swiftly on, I'm going to go as fast as we can here so we don't bore people. The video adapter in this card, on this particular uh, motherboard card I should say, is uh, a Western Digital Paradise uh, with 256 kilobytes of RAM. Now 256 kilobytes of RAM is the built-in video card. Um, and I still haven't found the video chip. I will, oh, not the video chip, the actual video RAM. It is there, I, it just, I have to look at it a bit closer. Get the old glasses out, you know. Um, but if you want to find it on your own board, if you have one of these machines, just look for something with a little minus 7 or a minus 6 on the chip. That's generally the RAM, okay, for the actual video card. Um, now, EGA VGA video adapter, that is because of the type of monitoring they have installed in your computer. Most monitors that were VGA or SVGA compliant were also EGA compliant. EGA is Enhanced Graphics Array, VGA is Video Graphics Array, and SVGA is Super Video Graphics Array. Okay, so there's your three main uh, uh, graphics uh, types. Now we also have CGA, which is Color Graphics Array, and MCGA, which is Multiple Color Graphics Array. Okay, or Multicolored Graphics Array. Now MCGA was, you know, wasn't as high resolution as SVGA. And SVGA was the standard that was eventually adopted by everybody and taken forward. Which is basically what we use now on all modern machines is an SVGA variant. Uh, hence the, uh, the D connector that you have on the back of most monitors. This monitor actually we're viewing at the moment has both a D connector and it has the more modern uh, high definition uh, connector on it. Now, the primary video there again is colour. Some people may have decided to, to change that to you know, black and white, you know. That depends on the monitor. I actually found on the ST computers the odd time when I turned them on, it would detect that the video, excuse me, it would detect that the actual monitor uh, was not able to run colour and would kick it into black and white. It tends to be an automatic feature. And the video adapter, as I said, you can, you can change to EGA, VGA, colour in your mono. You can change it there if you wish. Um, if you change it to mono, obviously colour there is going to change to, to, to mono or black and white. Okay? Colour 80. Great, isn't it? Colour 80 is 80 scan lines, just in case you wonder. Now, if you add the 640, 3328, and the 128, you get 4096. 4096 is the maximum available memory on this computer. As you see there on the right hand side, it says 3. 0.250. On older DOS computers like this one, uh, conventional memory, which is the top line there, it's actually highlighted at the moment. That's the bottom line, midline, top line. That conventional memory there um, basically is the most important aspect of running a computer in DOS. The reason why it's the most important line is all programs that run in DOS required a massive amount of conventional memory. It was something that Bill Gates and Microsoft had installed and said that nobody would ever want you know, to go above 640. You know, it's sort of the maximum of the memory that anybody would ever need. As a result, a lot of probes were configured to use that conventional memory. And as a result, it made it very difficult, and people got more RAM on their computers to actually use that additional RAM. So for example, this computer actually has 4 megabytes of RAM, but if the conventional memory is low, we can't use half the RAM. That is not a problem nowadays with Windows 95, Windows 98, Windows XP, Windows 2000, Windows 7, Windows 8, and Windows 9 in the future. It's not a problem because nowadays we're just based on the amount of RAM you actually physically have. So 1 gig, 2 gig, 6 gigs, 110 gigs, whatever. That's what's based on, rather than this convention. I will show you that in a little bit more detail a little bit later on, and I'll try to explain to you um, some options that you would have. And I'll show you a little program you can use. If you've got DOS 6.22 or above, 
there's a little program you can run and I'll just show you how to do it. That's just the easiest thing to run is the program. Um, and you know, let the program do the work for you. Uh, it's called MemMaker. I'll show it to you later. Okay, this computer actually does have a Maths code processor in it. Uh, the, the slot I showed you on an earlier video, I think it's in part one. Uh, it's definitely in part two. I took the dollar board out of this computer and showed you the 386 processor and a PGA socket beside it. The PGA socket beside it was for the WeirTech processor. And the other socket available on the board when I got this board was a socket uh, for the uh, 80387 uh, Maths code processor from Microsoft from, from Microsoft from Intel. And the Maths code processor was designed to run uh, FPU floating point uh, calculations. Uh, the floating point calculations are very important if you're running something such as AutoCAD, Autodesk 3 for 386. And it's you know basically an AutoCAD Autodesk is a is a is a drawing package for ar architects and draftsmen. So if you're going to your architect now, you know for your grand designs idea, you know Kevin McLeod, he would have had to install Maths code processors to run his AutoCAD programs. Okay, and this is just par parallel port settings. Um, the only one here that's any import any way important when you're running DOS is the IRQ7 here. The reason being is there's like 15 IRQs and they get used up very quickly. So you may find yourself when you've installed a couple of cars on your computer sort of swapping them about. Especially when you're running Windows uh, 3.1 or Windows 3.11. The reason being is that the resources are not automatically configured. Um, sound card uses an IRQ of 5. Parallel port generally uses an IRQ of 7. And the reason for these, you know, specific settings, you know, is is good. But sometimes you find you fill them up, or you need to move one around. But generally, don't change them unless you have a conflict in Windows. And um, because the the they're, they're, most manufacturers know what the standard settings are, they don't generally put you know a sound card at RQ7 as 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 the fault. They put it at RQ5. Again, that's something we have to go through later on. And uh, we're just going through the bias here, so we, we continue on. You can disable the onboard floppy adapter and you can disable the onboard hard disk adapter. Now the reason for disabling both of these would simply be if you wanted to install a more modern uh, ISA ATA adapter card. A more modern a controller card I should say. Why would you want to install one of them? Well, if you want to put a bigger hard drive into this computer, um, you've got two main options at the time. You could uh, purchase a Creative Labs uh, sound card or uh, a Genius sound card. ESS audio drive or ESS audio drive. It took me a, about a year to try to get that to work on the computer. Couldn't get that to work. I eventually got a credit the labs. Um, but the ESS audio drive uh, is, is a good system and I do like it. And I have used them since, but on the DOS machine it just gave me a headache and I don't know why. Um, but the ESS audio drive along the credit the labs, they were both um, cards that were added in for sound on these older computers. Um, not specifically the AST, mind you. So, what was the idea behind it? Well, you put in the add-on card, it had a, an ATA slash IDE uh, socket on, you plugged in your cable to it, plugged it into the back of your CD-ROM drive, and away you went. You then had a D drive there, no need to actually upgrade the full system. But, if it was now, and I know what I know now that I didn't know then, my recommendation would be to purchase an ISA um, add-in card that has parallel port built into it, that has uh, you know your, your control controller abilities built into it because it not only allows you to put in a bigger hardware into the computer, it also allows you to stick in uh, a senior ROM drive uh, on a hard drive, and it'll also take up less memory because the controller for the Creative Lab CD ROM drive uh, is a lot bigger uh, in conventional memory terms if you're running the old DOS games than just the standard MS CDEX um, CD ROM drive driver. Now I'll show you that a little bit later as well. If you want to see it. And I'll explain to you what way it works as well later on if you want to see it. And so that's what those two are. The the fault speed and the the, the fault speed of the computer is set to high. You can change that. AST had a had a system with software when the computer was running. You could change that to medium or low. Basically, what that was for was older software and it was designed for the 8086, 8088, and the 286. Ran a bit too fast on the old 386. So by reducing the speed, the program will be a bit more stable and also run a little bit better. Uh, Shadow BIOS to set the system. On modern machines and on older machines, I recommend you turn the Shadow BIOS on for both the system and the video. You'll see there the middle option, this one here, has a, a, an ability to set it for both system and video and system. 
Uh, I'm unable to set it for system and video because it only works with system and video if you have uh, the on-board graphics enabled. Or, I did notice once, although I'll have to try it again to make sure, I did notice it did work once when I put in an a AST's version of their video card. Um, the AST video card, again, was generally a, a 512 kilobyte uh, a Western Digital Paradise video card. Uh, Western Digital used to make video cards uh, along with a lot of other companies uh, before they went into hardware manufacturing. The cache in memory, always leave that enabled. No point in disabling it. Uh, chances of you running very old stuff on a 386, apart from your old games, uh, are going to be slim to none. So I'd leave that enabled. Again, you can disable it if you're having trouble, but the cache memory is, is very handy to have. It's something a lot of all 386s don't have, but this one actually does have. Um, the default the boot device is set to auto. Um, there's only really one choice in there, it's either auto or the C drive. Um, if you leave it on automatic, if you try boot from either of your floppy drives, your B or your A, if you set it to C, you just try and boot off the C drive first, and then it'll go to the floppy drives. But to be honest with you, leave it at automatic, or if you have a choice of leaving it at A, B or C, leave it at the A drive and the B drive. Reason being, it's uh, great if you do have a problem with your hard drive, it does happen to fail, you can stick the floppy disk in, turn the machine off, turn it back on, it'll boot up and you can you get out of trouble faster. Rather than having to go into the BIOS and change settings and blah blah, you know, it's easy. So automatic, A drive, B drive, or leave it as all. Uh, boot without keyboard, very handy if you just want to have a machine running into windows or you're Decide you want to turn a 386 into some sort of a server, leave that as disabled. The great thing is you can just turn on the computer, it'll boot into Windows for workgroups, and in it goes. You can have your hard drives there, you can use it for sharing your files. Yes, you can use a 386 for sharing files. And one of the downsides would be you'd have to install a 32 bit operating system such as Windows 95, because if you're using a more modern computer like something let's say Windows XP, and Windows 311 on DOS don't support long file names. What that means is the file names in DOS and Windows 3.1 are generally of 8 and 3 configuration. So for example, you can have the start of the word being 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, dot, or period if you're American, and then the final piece then must be only 3 letters long as well. So it's a short file name, it's 8 and 3. Okay, so auto exec dot bat, the you know, execution file has to be 8 characters long, dot, and a, a three-letter ending. The piece at the end dictates, um, you know, where you go, or you know, is it an executable? Is it a common file? Is it a back file? Is it a readme file? Is it a Docker? And so on. So yeah, you can do that. You can decide to leave that, you know, turn this into a server. You can leave that disabled if you're going to do something like that. But generally, you'd leave it uh, 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 disabled as it is there. You wouldn't put it onto enable because you want it to do with the keyboard. You want to make sure the keyboard is working. Non lock is just to allow the middle of the keypad, the right hand side of your keyboard, to be turned on or turned off. And you can choose that, not choose that, it makes no difference. You can hit the button yourself and visit the, the operating system. Uh, password enable, disable, self explanatory. That's basically designed to stop people getting into the BIOS and fiddling about it. I recommend you leave it disabled, um, unless there's a password remover jumper on the motherboard, as on some motherboards, there isn't a password remover jumper, and it's impossible to get the damn password off there. Or near to impossible. Um, it's extremely difficult for some computers anyway. Uh, server mode, as you see there, you know, enable and disable. Uh, you know, this allows the computer to operate in a server mode. But um, a lot of people aren't going to be using this particular computer for a server, uh, although the feature is there and is available. Right, what we're going to do next is we're going to boot up the computer into Windows and let it run, and we'll take a look from there uh, and see what happens. Just get it out of here. I'm not going to say anything in here. I'm going to boot up. Here it goes. This is going to boot up the DOS. And for those of you who haven't seen this before, I know there's loads of videos on YouTube uh, showing people booting up into Windows, showing loads of people booting up into DOS, showing people playing games, and all sorts of stuff. Well, let's just see. Let's just see what happens here. That's the CD-ROM drive there, a driver trying to work, but there's no CD-ROM drive installed. Okay, we can clear the screen by typing CLS. I mean, it's clear screen. Whoop! Everything disappeared. Now, I'm hoping, it's very hard to see on the little camera here, if you can actually see that little C prompt there at the top. 
I'm presuming it's there. I'll just give you my little pen here. Yeah. I think it's off, yeah, it's off the top of the screen so we can't see it. Let me just readjust the camera here so we can see the top of this. Okay, there we are now, okay? So that's the C prop there that you can see. So it's a bit out of focus of course. Should be able to readjust that. Now there we are. Okay, now that's the little C prompt. Uh, for the actual operating system. This is what you would see when you turned on the computer of this vintage. Okay, all you get is a little C prompt. So to get into Windows, you have to type in Win, W Y N. Okay, that lets you get to Windows. Now, if you wanted to go into Windows automatically, you could edit the auto EXE file. Okay, that's the command. Now, the way the command works is Edit is the command, it then wants to know what the hell you want to edit. Type in the particular program you want to edit. In this case here, it's a batch file. BAT is batch file. So as you can see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Perfect example of the short format. In the more modern Windows 95, Windows 98, Windows 3, Windows uh, NT series, um, you're allowed to have long file names. But in DOS, you're restricted by 8 and 3. Okay? So if I press enter now, it'll execute that for me. I wasn't going to do it there for a second, I kind of paused. Um, now in here you can see a few different options. If I want to get the computer just to boot, let's show you a quick thing here. If you want to get the computer to boot the Windows after it's run everything, just type in... Um, uh, just type in this. Wrong way, sorry. Okay. Or, you want to make it even quicker, you just type in this. Whoop, not up there of course. Just type in this. If you just type in that, it actually makes things even quicker again. The reason being is because you've got up here, you've got path, set to path, C code, Windows, and DOS. So that basically means that when you're at the C drive, I'll go back to that in a second. And let me show you, let me come out of here, right? Alt F X. Okay? So, Let's clear the screen again. If I type in win there now at the moment and press enter, it'll run. Because the path is set to run uh, any programs at the C prompt uh, and actually then go to the Windows folder and or the DOS folder automatically and check out and see where that program is. If I type in win, it'll look for an executable that starts with WIN. Okay? You don't need to type in win.com or you don't need to type in win.exe. It'll automatically look for both of them and execute the right one. Okay, so it's it's pretty clever. One thing that you can run in the old DOS, uh, which you've probably seen in Windows 95, is a uh, scan disk. Okay, so if I just do it like this scan disk version C, it'll now run scan disk. Now you've seen this in Windows 95, when the computer didn't shut down correctly, it would prompt you to run scan disk. You've seen this before. Um, if, you've run, if you run scan disk. Well, look at that now, huh? There's a problem. Probably just taking up space. It's terrible, isn't it? Okay. So I'm going to say don't fix it. I don't know what that is yet. We'll have a, we'll have a quick look. But at least it shows you an error, which is good. Uh, at least you've seen a bit of action here. Now. Let's run another program in DOS, which you've probably seen. You've probably seen Disk Defragmenter in Windows 95. Well, here's Disk Defrag in DOS. Now, just in case you wonder what these little things are, I'm typing here after them. These are what's known as flags, okay? And I'll show you how to get flags. I'll show you how to actually um, get a list of flags. If I take away the F and type in question mark, it'll show me a list of flags in DOS. So if there's any particular thing in DOS you're not sure of, any particular thing in DOS you want to know more information about, you can just literally type in forward slash question mark and it'll give you a full list of all the available flags. Okay, so we're just gonna we're gonna, whoop, we're gonna adjust that so that you can see a little bit more of it. Okay, right, we're gonna run defrag. Testing system memory, plenty of memory. Press enter. Now we're gonna optimize the hardware. 
Now, unfortunately, I have to let this run through. I can't quit this. But you've probably seen this defrag again in Windows 95 uh, running. This is the DOS version of, of defrag. Uh, the defrag mentor. A nice little tune there. You like that? And uh, this defrag mentor in DOS. Um, don't ever run it if you're running Windows 95. Um, <laughs> I can remember uh, having Windows 95 been a little bit peeved off with the speed of defrag on Windows 95. Uh, so decided to run it on DOS. Uh, it did run a lot faster, but the long file names all vanished when I went back into Windows, um, which wasn't good um, because I had some problems then trying to recover a lot of my files, which uh, were, you know, what I did last summer became Summer Squiggle 1. So uh, if anybody's ever played with long file names, they know what I mean, and if you haven't, uh, that's a little rare trick that you can find yourself later on. Okay, um, what else can we run here in, in DOS? We can also run, um, I, I'm trying to think what it's called. This here, by the way, means create directory. You're not actually creating the directory. You're actually, the directory already exists. What you're doing is you're actually going into the directory. Okay? If you don't have some of the commands in DOS, there's other little commands you can use which are built into the uh, command.com file. So if DOS isn't installed, but your computer is booting up just to the C prompt, there are a few things you can do um, with DOS. It's very limited though without the actual full DOS program installed. Yeah, I'm just going to try to find something here. Uh, you might be interested to see this. Just a cat there, but it's uh, spelled so. Uh, it'll be here in front of me now in a second. Uh, okay, well, as you can see there, actually, there's one thing there that's interesting as well. There's a backup program with this, of course, which allows you to back up your stuff to floppy disk. Again, that's okay if you have, uh, you know, only a small hard drive like this one. But when you go get something bigger, yeah, it's no use. Okay, this is what we want. This is Microsoft Antivirus by Symantec. How's that then, huh? Antivirus program and DOS came free with the operating system. So do a detect here. It's now going to detect the computer for viruses. Have a quick look around. This is Microsoft Antivirus for DOS 6.22. Um, at the time, a lot of viruses, there wasn't that many around, but it was great to have it in DOS. Um, unless you were on the internet, uh, you know, it didn't really affect most people. Um, it's a great little bit of, bit of software to have. You can also run this antivirus software if you install Windows 3.11. Um, when you've installed it, you can search the hard drive for other programs. And this is one of the other programs that it will actually find. It will actually find this particular program. It's a great little bit of kit. Um, we're showing you stuff here in DOS at the moment. Um, because a lot of people would have Windows 3.1 installed. Uh, I will put it up in a minute and we'll have a look at it. But this is just the antivirus software here that's running away. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll exit this now because I don't know where it's on this machine. Well, there was no way uh, the virus is detected in that short uh, little time. Okay. Pretty cool, huh? You like that? Now, the other program I was telling you about, if you're having problems with your conventional memory, run this program. Uh, MemMaker. The reason being is MemMaker uh, takes the pain out of configuring your RAM to allow uh, you know, these older DOS games to run. It makes life a little bit easier. Uh, run the MemMaker first, uh, see how you get on with MemMaker. If MemMaker is not good enough for you, then go and start configuring your configure.sys file and your auto.exe file. Uh, your auto.exe.bat file, I should say. Um, reason being is MemMaker does all, all the commands for you. It automatically puts what you're loading up when the computer turns on into memory. It decides whether it's in the upper memory and so on and so forth. You know, make sure everything is good. What it also does is it automatically optimizes the computer to, to use the least amount of conventional memory, therefore allowing you to run some of these programs. Uh, now we're going to get exit out of this. Exit and undo changes. Okay, now uh, one of the programs actually on here, um, some people have ran a lot, a lot of times, is uh, a demo of. Uh, what's, it, what's it called? Final Reality. Well, yes, I have it on here, and I have run it. It's not going to run, but 
the little error message you'll see here will be interesting. Um, I was talking to you earlier on about making your own boot disk. Well, there's no sound card in this computer at the minute. I took it out. Ah, now that's the that's the error I'm looking for. That's a good error. That's like that. That's the sort of error now that that makes me happy. But I'm trying to show you something. You'll notice down the bottom there it says not enough conventional memory. At least 570 bytes free is required. You see? But that's exactly what I was talking about. That's exactly what I was saying. These old DOS programs really, really, really like conventional memory. Now, second reality won't run for properly for a few reasons. And um, there's no sound card in this computer, um, which I took out, but I can put it back in. And there's also not enough conventional memory. So, how much memory have we actually used? Can we find out? Of course we can. We can type in them. It didn't work. Ah. Uh. There you are. It didn't work because the path is set for the C drive. So unless you're in the C drive or in the dust directory, the path won't work. Okay, there you have it now. So there's your conventional memory. There's the used memory. And that's what we got for free for 549. Now we can free up some of that memory. But what, what is using the memory? We can't see what's using the memory. Well, we can use another flag as it's called. So MEM space fortress P, which is means by pay, by page. Four slash C, which means classify. Now you can type in classify if you like, but just type in C. It's quicker. If you like me, you can't spell for hell. Type in C. Okay, now it's classifying what's in memory, where it's located, and how much is taken up. So, conventional memory. You can see here, DOS, can't move that. You can see what's taken up all the memory, you can see where it all is, and you can see how much is taken up. Now, what you could remove to make final reality work is the smart drive driver. You don't need the smart drive driver in DOS, and it only really works when you're in Windows, and it's of no benefit in DOS. So remove this particular driver out of here temporarily, put it back in after you've run the demo, and you know, everything will work nicely for you. And again, you can see here there's only 4 megs of RAM in the computer. It shows you it here nicely. Okay. Press on the key to continue. The reason why I done a forward slash P, forward slash C was for that exact reason. If I just typed in, I'll show you now, men, forward slash C, classify, uh, a whole lot disappears up the screen, you missed half of it. So by typing, by typing the P, it allows you to actually uh, see the full classification of the memory. It also shows you per page, which basically means that the screen fills up with the first bit of information, <coughs> press the space bar, moves up, shows the second bit of information, third bit, fourth bit, so on, until the full lot is shown. Okay? There's loads of commands in DOS. If you want to know any of the commands in DOS, want to know how to do stuff in DOS, let me know. I'll do my best to facilitate you, do my best to show you. Okay? So that's memory shown to you now. That's a little bit of that you've already shown to you. It's a backup program there as well. There's a whole load of quirky little programs in DOS which are which are good fun to try out. There's also one called uh, uh, double space or drive space, depending on which version of DOS you have. And what double space slash drive space does is it gets all the files in your hard drive and compresses them into one big one big file. But what that does is if you have an older computer, instead of having 40 megabytes, you now have about 60 to 80 megabytes, depending on the compression, depending on the file. Some files can't be compressed as well as others. Just like the way WinZip will compress some file well, but won't compress other ones well, or the same way that um, WinRAR will compress some files better than others. It just depends on the type of file. But basically, you could be getting this hard, which is 40 megabytes, and <clears throat> you could be compressing it down and getting yourself a hell of a lot more space free. So you see there's just 6 megabytes free. Well, we could probably get about 10 free after compression. We might get a little bit more. Okay? It's worth doing it. It's a bit of fun, but I do recommend you back up your computer first. It can also be undone, but to undo it, you must have enough space in which to undo it. So if your hard drive is actually 40 megabytes, and you're trying to undo 60 megabytes of a compressed drive back on the 40, as you can see, it isn't going to work. It needs to be enough to actually do it. Again, this is all running on this AST386 uh, uh, computer, this DX25. Um, <coughs> we're just going to just going to lash it into Windows, as they say in Ireland. When do Windows go? This is Windows for Workgroups 3.11. And we're going to get a few error messages here popping up. 
Uh, reason being is I've removed the network card out of this computer and I've removed the sound card out of this computer. Um, I removed both devices because I was trying to run them on another machine uh, because I suspected I had a fault with them but there wasn't any problem with them at all. This computer I've also installed uh, Windows uh, Internet Explorer um, 3.1 which is a bit of fun. I've tried to run uh, you know, the actual Internet Explorer, I've tried to actually get it to put up some stuff and uh, it was working and working and working but just didn't really like it so I've removed it. Um, what you have here in front of you is basically you've got File Manager which is the Windows Explorer the more modern operating system, Control Panel uh, which is like your device manager, uh, you see here all the devices are all listed as soon as it comes up, there you are now your colour which is like your, 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 de your desktop colours, okay so you can change your, your, your colour schemes, uh, your fonts you know, that's just installing and uninstalling fonts. Ports, that's your COM ports 1 and 2. That's your LPT ports 1 and 2, depending on the many you have. Uh, your mouse, that's your mouse. You can decide whether or not you want it to be left-handed or right-handed. Uh, your desktop, that dictates the basic desktop background. Uh, your screensaver, the wallpapers and stuff like that. So like, you can change, for example, the screensaver in here. Uh, so like flying windows. Ooh, that's fast. So that's the 386 now running flying windows. Um, that can be improved by installing a slightly better video card driver. Um, but at the moment I'm having some trouble with the Video 7 drivers. Like I said, it's actually an S3 video video chip under there. Um, you can also change it to Starfield Simulation. I think you're on Star Trek. Or Star Wars, depending on what fan you're in. There you are now. Look at that, huh? Only go where no one's went before. Okay. It's very nerdy, of course. And next thing there is, of course, the keyboard. You can change the keyboard settings depending on where you're located. And um, keyboards are slightly different in the U.S. as they are in the U.K. And uh, some keys are in reverse. You can also install on Windows 3.11 the Euro symbol. So there you are. Uh, Windows didn't abandon us altogether. And uh, printers very self-explanatory. And uh, that allows you to install and uninstall printers within the operating system. Uh, international again. <coughs> Excuse me. It is allowing you to change the uh, you know, place you're actually located. This is set to the United States simply because I had just done an express install and never never bothered to actually set it up. But you can change that. Now, if I change that, it'll want me to put the Windows discs in, which I don't have to hand at the moment. Uh, I only go running down to get them. Okay, so let's come out of that. Uh, taking the time, self expansion Network. This is all the network settings that are installed. If you are installing um, Windows for Workgroups on an older computer and you want to actually get it to access your other computers on your network you can install a TCP IP 32-bit driver that is readily available, readily downloadable uh, it will then allow you to actually communicate with other computers on your network and also let them communicate with this it's very handy if you're running old games because uh, it will allow you to actually send the old games over to this computer uh, especially from the likes of Abandonware and stuff like that where there are old games say you put them with the floppy disk you can just send them over the network you can then quit, go back to DOS, use your boot disk and then run the hard drive nice and easy, makes things easy but um, it's just worth knowing that you know? it's, it's a good little thing to have we're up to 38 minutes here at the moment so I hope I haven't lost any of these just yet uh, 386 enhanced um, what the biggest thing in here that I've ever played with is the virtual memory. You can decide to have the virtual memory static or you can decide to have the virtual memory uh, mobile. Uh, I recommend you keep it static in Windows uh, 3.11, uh, in Windows 95 and, and above. Uh, it's generally it's mobile and it doesn't matter. It's a very advanced operating system and actually runs very well. On the older ones, I do recommend you put the virtual memory fixed. If, like me though, you have an old computer like this, um, you don't really use Windows for anything more than you know, transferring over a couple of files to run the old DOS games, then the same with the virtual memory, get it to be you know, mobile, get it to you know, choose whatever it likes as it boots into Windows. Reason being is, if you have it as a fixed amount of memory on your hard drive, it takes up that amount of space all the time. Virtual memory is designed uh, in such a way that when your computer runs out of its normal, you know, fast memory, it's 4 megabytes in this case, it then starts paging to the hard drive. 
Modern computers do the exact same thing. When they run out of the four gigs of RAM that they, they have, it then starts pasting to the hard drive and using the hard drive as a, as a memory location. It's not ideal, it's very slow. If your computer at the moment is paging a lot to the hard drive, it's probably got a virus, but never minding that, if it's doing a lot of that, even you know, uh, uh, you know, even as it's getting along, I recommend you upgrade your RAM and, and don't be relying on virtual memory. Just again, Windows 3.11, I recommend you have a fixed amount if you're going to be using it. If you're in DOS, don't bother. Windows 95, it's automatic, leave it, don't mess with it. Driver self expansion. This is where you install on more modern computers like your Windows 95. Don't mind that, that's like I said a problem with the video card, I haven't I have to sort that out. Um, the more modern computers, a lot of these drivers, when you install a new card, it automatically, automatically installs them. On the old computers, you have to actually manually install. Um, it's not as hard as it sounds, it's a bit of fun, it's a bit of a laugh. You can do you know, a few little bits with it. It didn't really cause me too much trouble when I used to be doing it on a regular basis. Uh, but um, yeah, it is a lot easier with Windows 95, a lot easier with Windows 98. Um, but uh, for nostalgic reasons, you should give it a go. The facts here, this doesn't exist on um, Windows 3.1. Uh, it only exists in the, the 3.11 for workgroups. The idea, of course, behind that is because of the workgroup operating system. Sound. This allows you to dictate, now they're all grayed out as you can see, because there's no sound card in, in, installed. If there was a sound card installed, these would all be, you know, coloured, or, you know, be dark, like, like, like the bottom set. They'd look like these lot down here. The reason why they're all grayed out is there's no sound card installed. If you install a sound card, you can then have ta-da, and bing, and all that sort of stuff when you hit buttons and all that. It's actually quite annoying sometimes, but it was great in the day because this computer, I had a 386, uh, 16 from uh, AST um, and I eventually put the sound card into it. It was amazing having a ding and a boing coming over. That wasn't the, you know, the PC speaker which is very tinny, you know. But well, nice. Uh, so that's the control panel. Uh, that's the main parts of the computer. Um, we could go through a few little bits here. We were already pushed on time. We're up nearly up to 45 minutes. Uh, might have been rambling on for a long time. Uh, you're probably bored at this stage if we turned off or switched off. If you haven't, and you've got to the end of the video, fair play. If you want to know anything else about the operating system, uh, let me know and I'll do my best to facilitate you and do my best to take a video of it and show you in more detail uh, how this stuff actually operates. Uh, until next time, and the next time I might show you something different again, but until next time, good luck, goodbye, slam that, slam that. August Gunnar Milamah. That's Irish, by the way, for goodbye and thanks very much.